The next thing on our program is Barb McArdle, and she is going to give her testimony. So I'm going to give you a little bio on her. Barb is a child of God. She's blessed with her 57-year marriage, six children, 18 grandchildren, and one great-grandson. Her working years involve three church-held jobs as a director of the church's daycare and preschool, a financial secretary, and an administrative assistant. She retired seven years ago from a job she loved as the accounts pay payable a payroll clerk and a large lumber company. She has had the opportunity to live in seven different states and 14 cities where she met many wonderful Christians who mentored her in her Christian walk. The Lord has given her a passion for the elderly as she works and ministers at Bonaventure Senior Living. She is a sports nut. She enjoys football, baseball, basketball, and never misses a grandchild's game. She loves board games and any kinds of card game, and she plays to win. She marvels at God's creation, and she enjoys her 17 houseplants. They must talk back to her. I don't know. Okay. As she has entered the winter of her life, she knows she is at a, a never-ending time of needing the Lord. She is honored to share her testimony with you today. And she is basing her um, testimony on John 4, verses 4 through 26, which is the Samaritan woman at the well. So here she is. Oh, it is so hot today. I just wish I could, I wish I could draw water in the morning when it's cool, or at twilight when the shadows from the mountains shade the well. But I must avoid those gossipy women who gather here then. They're always talking about me. Oh, wonder why my jug feels so heavy today. I'm just not the woman I used to be. I was pretty and I was happy. And now I'm just so weary and sad. My loose ways have caused me nothing. I wish I could put my past behind me, but it, it's too late for me. I wonder who that man is over there, sitting on the stone by the well. I've never seen him before. Why, he looks like a Jew. What would he be doing on the Samaritan road? There is so much hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's not, it's not safe for him here. I better just get my water and get on my way. What's that? He's speaking to me? He's asking me for a drink of water? But I'm a Samaritan. Why would he ask me for a drink of water? What? Now he says, I should be asking him for a drink of water. He can give me living water. Where would he get this living water? He has nothing to draw with, and the well is so deep. Does he think he's greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? The only living water I know about runs in the streams up by the mountains. What? Now he says, if I drink of the water of the well, I will get thirsty. But if I drink his water, I would never thirst again. I would never get thirsty. I would never have to come to the well again. Oh, I have to have that water. Oh, now he wants me to go get my husband. I have to tell him I, I don't have a husband. What? He knows that I've had five husbands and that the man I'm living with now I'm not married to. I've never seen this man before, and he knows all about my past. I know he must be a Jewish prophet. And the Jews say that we should worship the Father in Jerusalem. But he's saying that the day will come when we will not worship him on this mountainside or in Jerusalem. 
And he says that us Samaritans don't know whom we worship, but the Jews do because salvation comes from the Jews. The day will come when God's people will worship him in truth and in spirit. What's that? What? He says he's the Messiah. He is the Messiah. I am talking to the Messiah. I must run back to town and tell everybody I have seen the Messiah and I've drunk from the fountain of living water. The Samaritan woman put down her water jug that day and on winged feet she went into town to tell the others, come see the man who had told her everything. Certainly he must be the Messiah, she said. Her face had this new piercing light and she could make the non-believers believe that she had drunk from the spiritual fountain of water. Many people longing to receive that same gift streamed out toward Jesus. He and his disciples stayed for two days and many conversions followed. For the very first time they called him Christ, the Savior of the world. Ladies, I have tasted that water. I was 13 years old while attending a junior high youth fellowship meeting on a Sunday night at the United Methodist Church in Owatonna, Minnesota, when Reverend Folker told us about the living water. He said we needed to confess our sins, ask God to cleanse us, and then invite him into our hearts. I received Christ that night. This is not a thunder and lightning conversion story. I certainly hadn't had five husbands, nor was I living with a man that I wasn't married to. But there were areas in my life, in my young life, that needed cleansing. My life hasn't been all peaches and cream since that night, and God didn't say it would be, but he promised me that he would always be with me. In Hebrews 13.5, Jesus says, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. Psalms 94.14 says, the Lord will not abandon his people. And at age 75, I can look back over the past 62 years and tell you that the Lord has blessed this young girl as I have tried to honor him and the commitment that I made to him that night. I stumble daily, but he picks me up and he gives me that cool drink of water. Heartaches have come, but just as he promised, he's always been there. Our oldest daughter was five months pregnant with her fifth child when the doctor discovered cervical cancer. He offered her an abortion and she said, no, the problem is mine, the baby is okay. The whole situation was so frightening and how to keep her encouraged, how to pray. And then one day, I called on the Lord and he gave me the 34th Psalm. It says, I, Barbara, sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me, Barbara, from my fears. Those two who look to him are radiant, their faces are never covered with shame. This poor woman, Barbara, called and the Lord heard her. He saved her out of her troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the woman, me, Barbara, who takes refuge in him. Seven weeks after delivering a healthy nine-pound baby boy, a cancer specialist performed surgery on our daughter, cutting away all the cancer that they could find, and they put her on a stringent vitamin program for a year, and we've never heard the word cancer again. That baby boy is 24 years old. He's a Marine and a firefighter. Praise the Lord for his miracles. When I was 24 years old, my dad died. He was two weeks away from his 52nd birthday. He and mother had been married for 31 years. They had seven grandchildren, and life was good. And then the cancer took over. 
He was hospitalized for six weeks. He suffered terribly as we watched him scream with pain. He died on September 24, 1969. And I still miss him every day. 50 years later, and I still miss him every day. Now, my dad was not a Christian. He went to church on holidays, and he never missed one of our, his children's programs. But other than that, he didn't have time for church. One afternoon, while hospitalized, he wanted to talk to our family pastor. They spent time alone behind closed doors, and when Reverend Wilson came out of that room, he told us, Dad'll be okay. He had repented of his sins and asked Jesus into his heart. When we entered the room, he was in a peaceful sleep, and for the next five days, he remained pain-free. He died on the fifth day. After his death, I experienced all those emotions that you hear about. The shock, the denial, the anger. At one point, I didn't even care if he was suffering. It meant I still had him. He was still alive. But now the funeral home had been called, and they were coming for him. Not my dad. He couldn't be dead. I remember being in the hospital bathroom moments after they pronounced him dead, vomiting and crying out, Lord, why my dad? He's such a good person. Why not the drunk in the gutter? I was so angry that I could not pray for about five months. And then the acceptance came one morning in Sunday school class when God gave me this scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses through 18 say, Our brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died, so you will not be sad as those who have no hope. We, Christians, who believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will come back with Jesus, and those who have died believing in him, my dad, will go with him in the air. There will be a sound, shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come from heaven. And those who died believing in Christ, again, my dad, will rise first, and then we, Christians, who are living at that time, will be gathered up along with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. God's words were like a cool drink of water to me that day. I will see my dad again, and what a day that will be. Currently, I'm facing my biggest challenge ever. Six months ago, my husband of 57 years died of a heart attack in our home. The shock, the denial, the anger, they've all been there. But I told you earlier that I have been blessed all through my life as I've tried to serve the Lord. And boy, did he ever bless me with a wonderful, wonderful husband. He loved me through the good, the bad, and everything in between. He loved our six children unconditionally. And most of all, he loved the Lord. As I watched him study, his Bible daily, and he shared his knowledge through preaching and teaching. I just grew to love him and the Lord more and more. I miss Ray terribly. I grieve daily. I would have never picked this road. I cannot imagine anyone choosing to walk this awful journey. I cannot change what happened, but with my faith and my family, I'm adjusting. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there is an appointed time for everything, 
and a time for every event under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Some nights, no sleep. Some nights, so many tears. But the Lord knows every tear on my pillowcase. Lamentations 3, 20 through 23 tells us that his loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassion never fails. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. With the hope that I have in Christ Jesus, I thank him every day that Ray is with him. And once again, I am standing on Thessalonians 4, knowing that as a believer, I will see my beloved Ray again. Sisters, Christ did for the woman at the well what no one else could do. Until she met Jesus, her life was pretty bleak. Every time she went out, she was reminded that she was different. But Jesus, who knew all about her past, forgave her of her sins, loved her unconditionally, and died on the cross so she could have that living water. Christ did for me what no one else could do. He took my sins and my sorrows and made them his own. He can do for you what no one else can do. I would invite any of you who have never tasted the water to come forward if you would like us to pray with you. Or maybe you've tasted the water and it's just been a while for you. There are ladies available, the prayer tent is available, I'm available. If anybody needs prayer, this would be the time. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.